unsettled times lead to much anxious speculation about the future. You know, that's true in our day with wars and famines constantly in the news, storms and earthquakes striking without notice and political struggles at home and abroad. But it was also true in John's day. He was a prisoner on the Isle of Patmos. The other apostles had all been martyred and at least one local preacher had been killed for the faith. Everyone was wondering what the future held for the church. And through a vision, John was informed that he was to be shown what was about to take place. It was obvious. The immediate future didn't look good. So what John was promised would help prepare the church for what lay ahead. He was anxious to see that. But before God revealed to John the future, he gave him a vision of the throne of heaven. And it was imperative that the Christians be assured that God was still in control, that he was still running the universe, even if the immediate future looked bleak. Once that was made clear, the future could be unfolded with confidence. Well, the vision continues in the fifth chapter of Revelation, and we now see a book in the hand of God, a book that is sealed with seven seals, and we anxiously await for the book to be opened. But there seems to be a problem. Before the book can be opened, someone has to be found who is worthy to open it. John writes, and I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to break his seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it. And, and I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. As we noted in the fourth chapter, there was no attempt to picture the person of God on the throne of heaven. All we saw was the radiance of God, like the radiance of precious gems, like some rings I've seen today. But that radiance was all, all we could see. But now, from the midst of the radiance, something appears. We see a hand. And we see a hand because we're meant to see something in the hand of God. In his hand is a book, or more properly, a scroll. A scroll with writing on both the inside and the outside. A scroll filled to overflowing with much needed information. But the scroll was sealed with seven seals. It was a common practice to seal important documents with a, a drop of melted wax and then imprint it. Contracts were thus sealed so they couldn't be altered. Wills were sealed by as many as seven witnesses, only to be opened by them or their representatives at the death of the testator. What we have pictured here is a very important document in the hand of God. And not one that just anyone can open. So a search begins for someone who can, someone with the moral authority to take the book from the hand of Almighty God. Someone able to open it and reveal its contents to John, to the churches of Asia Minor, and to us. A strong angel with a loud voice initiates the search. Who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals, he asks. But no one responds. No one in heaven was worthy. No spiritual being was able to open the book. 
No one on earth was worthy. No living man dared to think he could open it. And no one under the earth, in the grave, was worthy. No one who had ever lived, not even the patriarchs of old, could open it. It appeared that no one in the entire physical or spiritual universe could open the book and look into it. It appeared that its contents would be sealed forever. No one other than God himself would know what the future held. No one would be able to make sense of what was about to take place. The vision of the future John had been promised could not be revealed. The churches couldn't be prepared for what was to come. It looked as if John's vision was about to end because no one was worthy to open the scroll that contained the rest of the vision. John began to weep and to weep greatly. His heart was broken. His hopes had been dashed. He wasn't going to be able to deliver the message of hope or encouragement that he knew the churches needed. Or so it appeared. Now John, like so many of us, jumped to a conclusion before the matter had been concluded. You know, how often do we despair when things don't go the way we think they should? How often do we throw in the towel and assume God has lost control because the immediate future looks bleak to us? The apostles went back to fishing for fish when Jesus didn't show up as expected. They thought their kingdom work was over, but it wasn't. And John thought his vision was over, but it wasn't. And one of the elders said to me, stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the world. And he came. And he took it out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. One of the 24 elders who sat upon the thrones that encircled the throne of God broke into John's premature pity party and said, Stop weeping. Open your eyes. Behold. The lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. In a moment of disappointment, even John had apparently forgotten that there was one who, without a doubt, would be worthy. The lion from the tribe of Judah would be able to open the book. The one prophesied from the lineage of David would be able, the Messiah would be worthy. John knew that. But in the fog of despair, he couldn't see it. When he cleared his eyes, his faith returned. He no doubt expected to see a mighty lion come forth. But between the throne and the circle of thrones upon which the elders sat, close to the four cherubim, John saw something else. He saw a lamb not a lion, a lamb that had been slain. Its throat had been slashed and its blood spilt. It was obviously a sacrificial offering. But this lamb was standing. It was still alive. On its head were seven horns and it had seven eyes. And seven as we've come to understand, signifies completeness or perfection. Instead of seeing the lion from the tribe of Judah, John was seeing the risen lamb of God. Horns were well-known symbols of power, so this risen lamb of God was all-powerful, omnipotent. 
The seven eyes indicated he could see everything. He was all-knowing, omniscient. The seven eyes also pictured the seven spirits of God, the Holy Spirit. And through the Holy Spirit, the Lamb could be present everywhere, omnipresent. This Lamb had all the attributes of God. He was the Messiah of promise, the Savior, the Redeemer of mankind. This was a vision of the Lamb of God who went to the cross and paid the penalty for our sin and rose victorious over death, securing for us the promise of eternal life. This lamb went directly to the throne of God and took the scroll out of the hand of him who sat on the throne, out of the very hand of God. And he could do this because the lamb alone is worthy. And when he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, having each one a harp and a golden bowl full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy art thou to take the book and to break its seals. For thou wast slain and didst purchase for God with thy blood men from every tribe and tongue and nation. And thou hast made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the number of, of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea, and all things in them, I heard saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. When the risen Lamb of God took the scroll from the hand of God, all heaven and earth broke forth with his praises. The four living creatures, the cherubim of God, fell down before the Lamb. And the 24 elders fell down before him, offering to him the prayers of thanksgiving and praise that had come before the throne of God from the saints on earth. The elders then took up their harps and sang a new song, a song that's been called the Song of Redemption. Worthy art thou to take the book and to break its seals, for thou wast slain and didst purchase for God, or as the King James Version puts it, hast redeemed us with thy blood, men from every tribe and tongue and nation, for thou hast made them to be a kingdom and a priest to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Their song proclaimed that the lamb was worthy because he had been slain. He had shed his blood. He had paid the price necessary to secure the future for men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation, for all men everywhere who would trust him to save them. The church was about to be reminded that they had been made a part of an everlasting kingdom and that priestly access to the throne of God had been purchased by the slain and risen Lamb of God. Their future was secure. Even in times of persecution, the church, the kingdom of God, will reign upon the earth. 
This caused the elders to sing, and they were joined by myriads of myriads and thousands and thousands of angels. The entire host of heaven joined with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Power, riches, wisdom, might, honor, glory, Blessing, again, with number seven. The lamb has everything needed and deserves everything given to him. The risen lamb has all power. He's able to do anything. He has all riches. He has the resources to meet every need. He has all wisdom. He is a solution to the questions and problems of life. He has all strength. He's stronger than the forces of evil. He is deserving of all honor. Every knee will bow before him. And all glory, he shares the praise due to God himself. And all blessing, we bless him. him. We bless him by living lives that acknowledge that every good and perfect gift comes from him. The heavenly chorus was then joined by every created thing in heaven, on earth, under the earth, on the sea, and in the sea. And together they proclaim to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. The Father and the Son are being pictured together in the throne room of heaven. The Lamb of God had paid the price. He had proven himself worthy to take the sealed up future from the hand of God and to reveal it to those who had entrusted themselves to him. Their immediate future, no matter how bleak, could be revealed and endured because their future had been secured by the Lamb of God. We too can and someday will join with the hosts of heaven in singing praises to the Lamb if we've bowed before him. And our future is secure if we've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb.